Welcome to uh, TH3 Lessons from the Pandemic. I'm your moderator, Eva Dixon, and this is our last session of ISRP 2022. Uh, we're very happy that you've joined us for this session and just a few procedural reminders. Um, of course, as always, this session is being recorded as part of the on-demand conference package. And for the audience to the session, Please use the Q&A uh, function to enter your questions and the chat for other types of communications. And uh, finally, uh, in terms of how the session will run, we have uh, two presentations, and then we have a uh, break and followed by five more presentations before the session is over. All right, well, welcome to our uh, first speaker. Our keynote speaker for this session is uh, Trish Greenhaw. She will be speaking on Prisoners of Mental Models, A Tale of Two Diseases. Uh, she's a professor of primary care health sciences at the University of Oxford with undergraduate degrees in sociology and medicine and a doctorate in laboratory science and an MBA. She leads a program of research at the interface between the social sciences and medicine, working across primary and secondary care. And she's brought this particular perspective to the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at various themes, including uh, clinical assessment of patients by phone and video, the science and anthropology of face coverings, and the policy decision makings in conditions of uncertainty. And uh, thank you, Trish, you have the mic. Fantastic. So I'll just share my screen. Thank you so much for having me uh, to give this ISRP keynote lecture. Uh, and thank you those who are staying beyond the um, beyond the end of the working day. Um, I've called this talk uh, Prisoners of Mental Models. A tale of two diseases, and, and you can see from the pictures at the top that one of those diseases is cholera. That's the famous Broad Street Pump, uh, which uh, I'm sure you all know uh, the story of Jon Snow, who took the handle off the pump and reduced dramatically the cases of cholera in the streets around it uh, in the 19th century. The other disease I'm going to be talking about, of course, is COVID. Um, and I'm going to be arguing that, that both of these diseases um, were approached with particular mental models, uh, and both of them were wrong. Now, as I've said, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for, to my research team and my collaborators, my employers, and also my funders who I have um, listed as these uh, various icons. So, so that although I'm, I'm presenting my own views, uh, I am very well supported uh, by a, a big team. Um, so let's get on with the talk. Look, I, I wrote a paper um, all about mental models, miasmas, mental models and preventive public health. Uh, and that was published um, in the Royal Society Interface, uh, I think last year. And within that paper, I quoted Immanuel Kant, who said thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. Um, and Immanuel Kant's A Critique of Pure Reason, from which that is quoted, is sometimes described as the most difficult philosophical paper ever published. Uh, so if you can't get your head around it, don't worry, because Sean Carroll put the same sentiments into much clearer language. Uh, very recently, just a few years ago, uh, in, in a book that he wrote called The Big Picture. Um, and he said, theory without data is blind, data without theory is lame. But what's theory? Well, theory is mental models. We approach uh, the world with a mental model of how we think it works. Uh, and when that mental model is a reasonable reflection of how the world works, uh, we do better science than if our mental model is flawed. Uh, here's another one of my heroes, Sir Peter Medawa, Nobel Prize winning immunologist. He said in, in a lovely paper called Induction and Intuition in Scientific Thought, uh, he said, scientists need to do more than browse over the field of nature like cows at pasture because 
scientific reasoning is not merely the apprehension of facts, but an exploratory dialogue that can always be resolved into two voices, imaginative and critical. The initiative for scientific action, said Medua, comes not from the apprehension of facts, but from an imaginative preconception of what might be true. Uh, and he also said, I haven't I've written it out here, he also said a, a wonderful quote about scientific hypotheses. He said, it's, it can certainly be true about every hypothesis that it could possibly be true. And it's that possibility of truth that distinguishes the scientific imagination from the purely fanciful or fictional. So when we think of science, we really often think of the facts being out there and off we go as scientists to collect them. And then really the, 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 the data speak for themselves. And what Medua is saying is, well, no, they don't because there's this component of science, which is the imaginative element. He sometimes called that the female side and, and the fact finding the male side, but let's go swiftly on before we get into a battle of the sexes. So this is what I'm, I want to say to you in a nutshell. We don't approach any scientific problem theory blind. Whether we're conscious of it or not, we begin with an assumed fairly broad brush theory and we tend to frame problems in a way that aligns more or less with that theory and which really seeks to refine that theory. I know Karl Popper said it was all about falsification uh, but actually, um, people who studied scientists will often say, well, you, you don't mind falsifying little bits around the edge, but really what you're trying to do is uh, affirm the mental model of reality that you've got. Even when we appear to be being dispassionate, uh, we drive our train along rails that were laid by previous scientists. And it was that actually Wittgenstein, the philosopher Wittgenstein, who talked about the railway tracks of science. Um, and it's so much more difficult um, presenting a scientific hypothesis, which isn't the same gauge as the prevailing railway, if you like. So those who challenge this normal science, as Thomas Kuhn put it, um, don't get an easy ride. And that's what I want to, uh, to show you with two examples. So let's go straight back to the, um, to the 19th century, the mid 1800s, John Snow, the Broad Street Pump, of course, in Soho, where at the time it was pretty, pretty downtrodden and there were an awful lot of people dying of cholera. John Snow was, as I'm sure you know, a public health doctor. Now, before that particular cholera uh, outbreak, uh, Edwin Chadwick, who, who uh, was, I think, a public health um, person, certainly he was a sort of social reformer and general kind of knower of things, he had developed a theory called the miasma theory of cholera. Uh, he said it was spread by foul air. So miasma means the, the smell of sewage, smell of horrible stuff. Um, and as far as Edwin Chadwick was concerned, whenever there was the smell of sewage, uh, people got cholera. Therefore, it was the smell of sewage that caused the cholera. Uh, and you can already see the uh, slight flaw in the logic there. But that was the prevailing theory at the time. Now, of course, because they were scientific, uh, they were just as scientific as we are, they just hadn't, the science hadn't progressed quite as far. The kind of data they collected in the mid 1800s to inform the science of cholera spread included these. The weather conditions, um, the temperature of the air, the humidity of the air, I suppose that is partly weather conditions, whether the air smelt foul. So we would go around sniffing the air and writing down what it smelt like. Elevation of the land, uh, because miasma was believed to stay very low to the ground. So, of course, if that's, if that's the belief, you'll think it's very important to measure how high up the houses were. Whether the houses looked and smelt clean, and also whether containers used for water were clean. So all those things were measured. There was a lot of things that wasn't measured, like where people got their water from, for example. Now... John Snow, having observed deaths in his locality and also a colleague of his, Henry Whitehead, wanted to add another question to the weekly statistical returns. 
uh, which was which pump did people get their water from? And they asked that question. And once they'd got data on that, it didn't take them very long. It took them less than a year to um, confirm their preliminary hypothesis that it did seem to be something to do with the source of the water. They removed the pump handle and the outbreak very quickly um, uh, came under control. Well, that's all very well. That, that was happening in 1854. But in 1855, look what happened. The National Board of Health report on the Soho cholera epidemic. So this is a year later, a bit like the public inquiry we're about to have on COVID. And this is what it said. It has been suggested by Dr. Snow that the real cause of the epidemic lay in the general use of one particular well situated at Broad Street. And having it was imagined, its waters contaminated with the rice water evacuations of cholera patients. After careful inquiry, we see no reason to adopt this belief. We do not find it established that the water was contaminated in the manner alleged, perhaps because they weren't looking for it, nor is there before us any sufficient evidence to show whether inhabitants of the district drinking from that well suffered in proportion more than other inhabitants of the district who drank from other sources. So let me just highlight, after careful inquiry, what careful inquiry was that? Uh, you can see that the claim to the moral high ground here, that we've really done a very rigorous study, very robust. We see no reason to adopt this belief. We do not find it established, no evidence to support this. Um, now, I want you to remember the tone and the terminology used by this board, even though uh, Jon Snow had successfully got on top of the cholera uh, epidemic, uh, or at least outbreak in Soho. Furthermore, in 1855, The Lancet, the editor of The Lancet, Thomas Wakeley, uh, decided he was going to be critical of uh, Dr. Snow. He said, in, in riding his hobby horse very hard, Dr. Snow has fallen down through a gully hole and has never since been able to get out again. So what they're doing is they're accusing Jon Snow of being trapped in an incorrect mental model, uh, whereas actually the people who were trapped in the incorrect mental model were the people who were following Chadwick's uh, model. Jon Snow died in 1858. The miasma theory of cholera, cholera persisted and continued to influence policy until a much worse outbreak of cholera in 1866, so uh, 12, 13 years uh, after the outbreak that Jon Snow had successfully dealt with. Uh, and in that, 93% of all victims were customers of a particular water company. No big bang happened. Nobody wrote a piece in The Lancet apologizing for what actually they did 150 years later, but that's another story. But at the time, they just quietly faded it out and quietly reintroduced it. No one wanted to admit that they'd been wrong all along. And then we got the waterborne theory of cholera, which we all know. Now let's move to SARS CoV 2. So the question here is, um, Again, it, it's, it's air versus water in a way, or at least it's airborne theory versus droplet theory. Now, look at this famous or infamous tweet from the World Health Organization sent on the 28th of March, 2020. Uh, and what they're doing is they're saying it's fake news, um, that this claim that COVID is airborne, it's fake news. It's mainly transmitted through droplets. Um, and then this whole kind of emphasis on hand washing and avoiding touching the face, because if it was droplet spread, then you'd touch your face, you'd get that droplet on your hand, you'd put it onto someone else, and then they'd catch it. Now, um, during March of 2020, colleagues and I were busy writing a paper um, suggesting that we needed to use the precautionary principle. We don't have 100% proof yet, but let's act pragmatically on the basis of the many stories we have. And I'm gonna tell you about those stories in a minute. 
So we submitted this to the British Medical Journal in about on about the 10th of March. It was published on the 2nd of April. And what we were saying was um, we need to introduce uh, masking policies for everybody. You remember that we remember there was no cure for this at the time that people were sort of uh, collapsing in the streets and things like that. Let's just uh, put some masks on just in case it's airborne. Now, let's take a look at the two um, at, at a balance scale of the uh, two key papers that were published about a year after that. Uh, both of them were addressing the question, is SARS-CoV-2 airborne? And um, on the 24th of March, 2021, Professor Hennigan's team um, argued no. They published what they thought at the time was going to be the first version of, a, of an iteratively improved living systematic review. In other words, it was a summary of the evidence that would be continually updated as new evidence came in. Um, and that was uh, put up on a preprint server. Uh, and at the time they were saying there's no evidence, no good evidence, no strong evidence for airborne transmission. And you can see that within three, less than three weeks later, um, the Lancet published our commentary, which re referred directly to this uh, living systematic review, because we were very concerned that this uh, piece of work was going to further influence WHO policy. It had been paid for by WHO. Uh, John Conley, uh, who was on it, was actually the chair of the working group at the WHO on infection transmission. So this was a very powerfully kind of commissioned piece of work. And I'm not massively in the habit of, of, of publishing um, counter narratives like this. But we felt there was a, a really good public interest reason to set out the evidence very clearly about why this was uh, an airborne disease. And I want to take you back now to a book Quite an old book now. I think it was published um, at around in around 1998 by Tony Betcher and Paul Trowler called Academic Tribes and Territories. And they argue, uh, uh, following uh, people like Thomas Kuhn, that different groups of scientists have different mental models. Um, and I'm going to look at two tribes here. The first tribe is evidence-based medicine. And its totem, as you can see, is the hierarchy of evidence with the randomized controlled trial at the top and case-based reasoning at the bottom and various other types of evidence in the middle. The idea is that the best kind of evidence they, they, they assume is that randomized trial or, or even better, a systematic review of randomized trials and other evidence is, is so much less valuable that we can, we can safely ignore it, ignore it. The second tribe looks at evidence very differently. Uh, it's the pragmatic public health tribe, if you like, and its to totem is the real world case study. They love looking at things happening in the real world uh, and the sort of real world events that they were particularly looking at were, of course, those super spreading events, what was happening in the quarantine hotels, um, the patterns of, of how things were unfolding. Um, they weren't opposed to randomized controlled trials, um, but firstly, there weren't very many of them those trials and also they, they wanted to kind of put them all together in like a jigsaw which is why I'm illustrating it with this picture of lots of different kinds of evidence. Okay so here's the evidence-based medicine mental model that there's a hierarchy of evidence which is actually a hierarchy of methods that the randomized trials at the top that good science is defined by the use of correct methods. If you've used a randomized trial that's good if you haven't it's probably not good science that, as I've said, some methods are better than others. And also that if participants are randomized in an experiment, that's good science. And if they're not, it's less good science. So this mental model led Hennigan and Jefferson to reject all evidence on the use of masks, except systematic reviews and randomized controlled trials. Uh, and in something called a Cochrane review, they uh, had this sentence, evidence from 14 trials on the use of masks versus no masks was disappointing. It showed no effect in either healthcare workers or in community settings. You can see down on the right-hand side of, of that, this slide, there's 
what they call a risk of bias assessment. So each, each different study is, is a row in that very tiny table. And then you've got the blobs. A green blob is good. That means they assume it's not biased, but a, but a, a yellow blob or a red blob is not so good. And you can see uh, that they've rejected an awful lot of the evidence because not many of them have got five green blobs, which is what they want. Now, this evidence, uh, as presented by the Evidence-Based Medicine Tribe, led Scott Atlas here, who at the time was President Trump's advisor on coronavirus, um, to, uh, to quote not just Hennigan and Jefferson, they were also quoting the World Health Organization and at the time the Centers for Disease Control in America. So this was, this was big, important sources they were quoting. Um, and they were saying that means that masks don't work and so we shouldn't have mask mandates at all. Now, I don't believe that either Hennigan and Jefferson or the WHO or the CDC were actually saying um, we agree with what, uh, what President Trump wants to happen. The trouble was that the way they'd expressed the evidence was, uh, was seized by uh, people with a bit of an ideological agenda. So let's move on to pragmatic public health. This tribe has a completely different mental model of what good evidence is and how to get hold of it. First of all, they say that there is no universally applicable hierarchy of evidence, though some methods may be more or less fit for purpose. And a good example here is that when we're talking about a possible airborne disease, and we've got lots of uh, examples of um, super spreading events involving singing and shouting indoors, then a method that involves analyzing those events might be particularly fit for purpose. But that doesn't mean that we should go around, uh, you know, analyzing indoor concerts for everything. Good science, say this tribe, is assumed to be defined by the use of multiple methods adaptively and pragmatically to build a nuanced narrative of what's happened and why. So very different from the EBM crew who are just gonna reject all evidence except this handful of RCTs. Uh, now the pragmatic public health people are theory people. They think that theory is at least as important as method. Those mental models that get you imagining at the beginning, what could this be? Um, the narrative also needs to make sense and be plausible. I put plausible to the natives, you know what I mean? You've got to get a story that hangs together, that explains every different bit of the data. It's no good just uh, explaining one thing uh, if your mental model is inconsistent with what, what you can observe in the other uh, parts of your data set. Now, here's some examples of evidence which the EBM tribe felt were not relevant. The sneeze videos, and you can see this is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is, this is pretty kind of mainstream stuff. Uh, but filming someone sneezing, it doesn't, it's not a randomized trial. It's, is it an experiment? Not really. It doesn't really look very rigorous and robust. And you remember I, I drew your attention to the, to the language of rigor and robustness and careful checking. Uh, and this just didn't really cut the mustard for the EBM people, but for the pragmatic public health people, they were, they were very interested in how far sneezes travel and how, how far the, the, both the droplets and the air in a cough or a sneeze might travel. Um, the stories about choir practices, and these were very systematically analyzed. Here's one that, that many of you are aware of. Um, with um, from the this is from the uh, CDC in in the US, the Skagit County choir practice where so many people went down with COVID and actually sadly two died. Uh, very meticulously analyzed, asking people, did they eat the sandwiches? Which lavatory did they use? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, here's another piece of evidence that was ignored by the EBM tribe. The the other countries, and you can see here a plot of the mortality from COVID uh, kind of anchored against the number of days from the first case. So then the, if, if the first case is day naught, you can see that um, in the red line, countries that didn't introduce a mask mandate 
in the first 100 days had very high rates of deaths, whereas the orange line and the blue line were ones who had introduced a, a population mask mandate um, by, uh, by the end of the month. In the, the blue line is masked by 15 days. Now, all sorts of other things, confounding variables were also happening in those countries, but this is pretty dramatic. On its own, it doesn't prove that masks work. And nobody in the public health drive says that, they, that, that it does prove that. But it's just one important piece of the jigsaw, which just because it doesn't prove everything on its own doesn't mean you should ignore it. Here's another interesting piece of the jigsaw, the ferret studies. Now, what you've got here is, is um, ferrets, uh, in, I think it's in the bottom cage had COVID and in the top cage initially didn't have COVID, but you can see this air duct with a lot of 90 degree bends because droplets don't go around corners. Um, the only way that the virus could have got to the cage on top was through the air rather than by a droplet. And then the, the second ferret got COVID and, and this was repeated lots of times. Now the EBM people would say, oh no, it's an animal study. It's, it's, first of all, it's not randomized, but also it's an animal study. But of course, in terms of mechanistic evidence, it demands an explanation. How did that ferret get, um, get COVID? We're not saying that a drug that cures a ferret will also cure a human. What we're doing here is demonstrating something that, that demands an explanation. And you can see that this was published in Nature. So again, it's not published in, in some, um, so, some sort of journal of rejected research. Um, there were also some fantastic reviews here. Uh, one was published in the British Medical Journal uh, about risk compensation, because one of the arguments from the evidence-based medicine people was, oh, if you're wearing a mask, you'll touch your face more, uh, and you also take uh, fewer other uh, precautions. So you won't, um, for example, stay two meters distant. Um, you won't wash your hands. But actually, um, Eleni Mansari's team showed that actually risk compensation doesn't occur. If, if you wear a mask, you're more likely to wash your hands, you're more likely to do the physical distancing. And then this second paper um, in JAMA showed that we actually touch our faces more when we're not wearing masks. Uh, but none of that was, was taken on board because they weren't randomized controlled trials. So let me summarize the, the two different um, perspectives on this. The EBM traditionalists are saying, no, it's not airborne because we haven't yet shown consistent direct isolation of viable virus from air samples, uh, nor have we shown consistent and direct infection of humans from sharing air. The pragmatic public health people who were working with the aerosol scientists said, wait a minute, look at super spreader events, look at long range transmission, for example, in quarantine hotels where, where people uh, never actually met, but they had to share air in a, in a corridor of a hotel and you've got CCTV and genetic linkage to show uh, that one had infected another. Uh, asymptomatic transmission, people uh, pass it on without coughing or sneezing, without producing any droplets. The fact that uh, COVID was so much more transmissible indoors than outdoors, uh, whereas if it was droplet transmitted, it shouldn't have made any difference. The ferret studies, uh, some air sampling studies were uh, had produced viable virus, but just not all of them. And, and some of you might actually be uh, people who, who do air sampling studies, you know how difficult they are. Uh, identifying the virus from air filters, uh, and also that hospital acquired COVID was dramatically reduced by the wearing of uh, high quality um, FFP2 or N95 masks. So lots of uh, evidence uh, for, um, for this virus being airborne. Now look at the quote in this Living Systematic Review, and it is almost identical in wording to the quote uh, in that public health report that rejected the hypothesis of John Snow. Uh, what they said was the lack of recoverable viral culture samples of SARS-CoV-2 prevents firm conclusions to be drawn about airborne transmission. The current evidence is low quality and there is an urgent need to standardize methods and improve reporting. So what they're doing here is basically saying that all those people who've been studying um, the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 
are doing pretty low quality work. Uh, uh, it's all a bit flaky. It's all a bit diverse. And we need to standardize everything uh, according to our hierarchy of evidence. Mm. This piece came out, it, it didn't come out on the 7th of April 2020, it came out on the 7th of April 2022, of course, so just over a month ago. And Diani Lewis, who's a fantastic investigative journalist, uh, said, look, early in the pandemic, that very first tweet I showed you, WHO stated SARS-CoV-2 was not transmitted through the air. That mistake has perpetuated. Um, in July 2020, as, as set out here in her piece, 237 aerosol scientists offered help to the WHO and they said at the time, at the time, nearly two years ago, there was overwhelming evidence for airborne transmission, but that offer was rejected. Uh, Dr. Conley, who was a co-author on the Hennigan Review, he was chair of the key WHO committee, uh, which rejected the offer of help from airborne scientists. Now, I've talked to you in a fairly apolitical way about how people's mental models get them fixated on a particular uh, uh, causal explanation, and actually it blinds them to the wealth of evidence uh, that's uh, actually out there. In this paper, uh, which I've published with uh, some social scientists, Mustafa Elzbilgin and, and Damian Contandriopoulos, um, we take a more political view. We take the view that mental models are not neutral, they are linked to what we call scientific capital, that is power, prestige, accolades and influence. And that is why people who hold particular mental models defend them very fiercely because uh, they may lose their power, prestige, accolades and influence, etc. if they start to back down from those models. And actually the, this rather more critical social science perspective on mental models, uh, if you're interested in this, uh, explains why this is becoming so entrenched. Um, uh, because actually there are still many, many um, public health organizations and groups around the world who are saying, well, there's not really enough evidence that this is an airborne disease. So thank you for your attention. And I believe we now have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Trish. Um, it, it's uh, time for you to start entering your questions into the Q&A. Thanks, and uh, you can put them there right now. Uh, in the meantime, Trish, um, I'm interested to know uh, in your country what the what the orthodoxy was, and and has the paradigm shifted at all? Goodness, I, funnily enough, I just got back um, the peer reviewers comments on a paper that is called something like narratives, counter narratives and social dramas about the different explanations of the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the UK. Uh, and that is a part of a series uh, which is about to be published in the British Medical Journal um, to inform the public inquiry whose terms of reference were published just yesterday, or maybe even today, it's, it's all kind of hotting up. Now, right at the beginning, the UK um, was without a doubt pushing a, a droplet infection uh, mode of transmission. We were very into hand washing, um, sanitizing hands, scrubbing down chairs, obsession with fomites, but also. Jenny Harris, who was uh, a leading um, voice in public health England at the time, was arguing against the use of masks because she felt that um, touching the mask might um, then create a, a fomite. Um, and actually, I, I'm going to quote um, Jeremy Howard, who used to say it's a piece of cloth, not a landmine. But certainly there was an awful lot of people saying the mask not just isn't effective, but could be uh, actively dangerous. Um, there have since then been a number of voices. It, it took quite a long time to, I think there were, it was about four months after our, no, three months after the publication of our mask paper where the, when the UK actually did introduce a mask mandate. But I would say they didn't do it because 
they realized that that this virus was airborne and i think they were they uh, were just falling in with uh, i think the cdc so i think it it, it kind of grumbled along um, and certainly uh, now one of the problems in the uk which i am actively uh, trying to campaign uh, about is is that there isn't really any systematic approach to air quality indoor air quality which i know is a topic dear to all your hearts so yeah we've got a long way to go, actually. All right, uh, we do have a, a question in the Q&A, and this one's from Dorothy Wigmore. She says, mm -hmm. I'm writing about workers' experiences in this pandemic and how they've been affected by the science that have been used or not used. And while frustrated as a hygienist who expected this fight, I'm fascinated by the reasons for the droplet dogma and why do you think those proponents have stuck to their dogma for so long? Well, yes. Yeah. So in that last paper, the the one which I, I wrote on on the sort of slightly more political side of it, um, we do look at the composition of that particular working group or committee at the WHO, which was charged with coming up with um, a mechanism of transmission and you know advising on appropriate interventions. And at the time that uh, the pandemic began, that committee was made up almost entirely of um, hospital doctors and also hospital infection control nurses who were hand washing experts. So they, so they were researchers, some of them were professors, but what they did research into was hand washing. And the reason for that is that uh, they were mostly hospital based and the kind of infections they were interested in preventing in their clinical days uh, were things like wound infections. So, you know, you have people with infected wounds uh, in a hospital. Of course, if you touch the wound and then go and touch another patient's wound, you will transmit. Um, and all that stuff that I remember when I was a medical student, the sort of barrier nursing of people with, with nasty diarrheas and things like that, and, and the scrubbing of hands, you know, the, 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 those sort of washing your hands up to above the elbow was something, was something I was taught to do in a hospital. Um, it didn't. It doesn't actually transmit terribly well um, to a community uh, respiratory condition. But I think there's another Jose um, Jimene and his team have done some great work showing that every respiratory disease is, um, to a large extent, airborne. Tuberculosis, of course, measles, um, influenza, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they were all assumed to be waterborne first. And yet it goes in and out of your lungs. I mean, that's why it's a respiratory disease. So I think it's not just COVID that, that's got the, you know, the, 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 the mental models are really very entrenched. But I think the particular problem with WHO uh, and the reason why they took so long to change their mind was the lack of aerosol scientists, the lack of um, public health people on that particular committee. Uh, and the use of this hierarchy of evidence that said our evidence is at the top of the triangle, your evidence is close to the bottom of the triangle, therefore our evidence is better than your evidence. And, th and that closed their minds. And it's, it's a great shame. A lot of people died, as you know. One of the observations that I made uh, early in the pandemic was that there were an awful lot of people who were quote unquote experts on this topic. And I was wondering, uh, as part of your sociological investigation, uh, how do we do a better job of defining who's an expert and who isn't? Well, isn't that interesting? Uh, I'm beginning to get interested in another kind of philosophy called pragmatist philosophy. And the pragmatist would say, bring everything to the table, bring all the evidence to the table and defend it in a discussion with all the critics. So if you trust the peer review process, for example, you submit your paper, you get 10 different peer reviews. You know, one person might think your paper is wonderful, but the other nine will say, wait a minute, you haven't thought of this. Now, with a pragmatist approach, um, the flat earthers can come to the table by all means. The moon is made of green cheese. People can come to the table because I want to hear what evidence do you have that the moon is made of green cheese? What evidence do you have that the, the world is flat? 
and they will have to present their evidence and then we will deliberate and discuss. Now, had we done that, had the aerosol scientists been allowed to sit around the table, uh, I think it would have become very clear that they knew what they were talking about. But, but this blocking that um, what we're calling uh, in this uh, BMJ paper, the inside track problem that certain experts were picked uh, as the only experts and their, um, their perspective was not challenged um, and other people just weren't invited to the table. And we are still in that situation. We're still in a pandemic. This is not history. This is what's going on right now. Uh, at the moment, we've got uh, a slightly different situation with these uh, probably 450 kids have had this ghastly hepatitis. And there's some people saying, well, hang on a minute, that might be caused by SARS-CoV-2. And there's another group of people saying, we mustn't even consider that. We mustn't even consider it because it's um, we've already decided it's not. And again, I think if you've got everyone in a room to discuss it, come on, bring your evidence and you bring your counter evidence and then let's hammer it out. Um, Thanks, Trish. Um, we, we have a couple more questions and about uh, three more minutes before the next presentation. So if you can try and pace your answers. Uh, the, the first question is from Dan Ship, and he says, uh, you've explained the issue in simple and convincing terms, which I think the public could easily grasp, but the public is being guided to listen to the WHO or national health authorities that continue to spread misinformation. How can this message be better publicized to influence public policy? Yeah, God, I wish I could answer that. Um, yes, one of the things that I am troubled by um, is that whilst it is the committee chaired by John Conley that is absolutely entrenched about this being a predominantly droplet disease, uh, except in what they call very specific circumstances where there's a lot of people packed in an indoor space or what they call aerosol generating procedures, um, the, the Conley committee is, is totally convinced of that. The rest of the WHO have moved on. And in fact, they've got working groups on air, airborne transmission. And if you like, the main WHO guidance now is reflecting an airborne model of transmission. And in fact, there's one set of guidance that has a little footnote and it says, this is not endorsed by this particular um, committee on infection control. So, so they, they've actually explicitly made it uh, they've made their internal conflict um, public. Now, I get the fact that John Conley isn't going to change his mind, but what I would like to see is Dr. Ted Dross and those leading people, Mike Ryan and, and people, instead of doing what the cholera lot did back in the 19th century and just sort of quietly sneaking in a few little bits about airborne spread, I would like to see the WHO leader campaign to say, Guys, we were wrong. We're sorry, but we'd like to make it really clear that the evidence is here. Uh, and they won't do that. And they won't do that. And that troubles me hugely, which is why I, I continue to make a noise about it, actually. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and one last question from uh, Simon Smith. Um, He's, he points out that there also seems to be a lack of understanding of how respirators function by those in positions of authority providing guidance. And is there any way that we can change that? And is there something that ISRP can do to help? Gosh, yes, absolutely. But of course, if you don't believe it's airborne, then you won't. Um, uh, then, you, then you're not going to even think about how a respirator works. But, but I mean, you know, I've just been out to the shops and almost nobody's wearing any masks. The ones that are aren't wearing respirators. But even if someone is wearing a respirator, guess what? It's kind of hanging down over their face. They don't get the bit about sealing around the round. If you haven't got a seal, the air goes around the sides. Because I think when I was a medical student, I had to wear a mask, for example, in, in theatre it was all about splashes, wasn't it? It was all about the droplets that were coming out of your mouth or the splashes that were coming out of the wound. And I think we have a, a kind of very subconscious mental model that the mask is there to stop the droplet. And actually, um, public masking using cloth masks is partly about controlling droplets from coughs and sneezes and all the rest of it. Um, so I think, yes, the public has no clue. The policymakers have no clue how respirators work. Um, 
if you put respirator into Google, you get the kind of uh, respirator that, that breathes for you. You don't get a face covering. Uh, it, the word is a bit weird. So yes, we really do need to, we, and I'm sure this organization could do something. And I'm, I'm hearing from Simon that your next conference is in Oxford in 2024, which is marvelous, marvelous. That's right. And, and maybe we'll have moved the bar by then. All right. Yeah, let's hope Thank so. you very much, Trish. Uh, we really appreciate your presentation.